morning, Spring House. Will you stand with us for praise and worship? Father God, we thank you for your sovereign hand and plan in our lives. Holy Spirit, we thank you for the places you've led us out of and the places that you're leading to, Father. May we submit to your will and not our own. May we pursue your will and not our own, Father. We give you praise and honor in this place. In Jesus' name, amen.
in all of our circumstances, church. We put our trust in him. Let's sing that together. I trust in God. Come on. My Savior, the one. Declare it. Who will never fail. He will never fail. I just want to share something real quick. I had a, a boss that was a Christian that once told me he went through something really hard. And he said, I learned to pray, God, I don't need a miracle, I need a memory. Tell me all of the ways, remind me all of the ways you've been with me this whole time because I can get through it with you. And I want to build your faith this morning. Raise your hand if you have a testimony where the Lord has heard you, you've sought the Lord. This is our story as a church. We all have these collective testimonies we can share with each other. He does answer us. He does. We praise you. One more time. I trust in God. Oh, Jesus. I trust in God. Come on. My Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. Surrender. This is my surrender. Here is 
whatever you want to do whatever you want to do I will make room for you to do whatever you want to do whatever you want to do let's just take a few minutes and Pray about the things we need to make room for the Lord to work out in our lives. The things that we need to lay down and trust Him with. Oh, I trust you, Jesus. I surrender all to you. I surrender all to you. trust you, Lord. It's not about us, God. In every circumstance. It's not about us, God. It's all about you. I will make room. I will make room for you, Jesus, Jesus. To do whatever you want to. To do whatever you want to. you may be seated this morning for a time of communion. As we come to the table of grace, would those who are serving the elements come forward, please? Over the last couple of weeks, uh, Tisha and I have been connected to a number of different challenges, and I thought this week as I was praying about what I was supposed to share, that I, I thought I was supposed to share that testimony about overcoming some of those challenges, and I've been convicted because I don't want to point at the challenges. I want to remember Jesus. I don't want to point at the things that are a thorn. And I don't want to point at the things that we've got to walk through. I want to point at Jesus. And, you, and you're going to hear that today, but I'm, I'm, I'll stop there. God is good. And that's what we do when we come to the table. We remember our Lord. We remember our Savior. Lord, we are so grateful. We're so grateful for what you've done for us and your, who you are for us. And at this time, when we come and when we dip the bread into the juice, we, we're doing it in remembrance of you. And we remember you, your life, your words, your sacrifice, and your victory. We thank you, Lord. Amen.
with a thousand tongues to lift one cry from north to south and east to west we'd hear Christ be magnified where the
Christ be magnified in me. Sing it all. Christ be seated for a time of tithes and offering this morning. Good morning. Uh, will those who are going to receive the tithes and offerings come forward? Last week I mentioned that I spent some of my formative years, certainly in the ministry in formative years, uh, in a church that just had boxes at the back. And of course in Jesus' day that's what they did in that was kind of where I was wanting to take this church a number of years ago. And the Lord uh, spoke to me and said, nope, uh, you know, th that worked for you. And it worked for the people in Jesus' day because they were taught. They were taught about giving from, from childhood on up. And I was too. So that's why it worked. So there's a little bit of teaching. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up, so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. They could just put it in a box. You ever been in a, uh, in a service where they took up an offering with a plea or maybe with a uh, with a with a hardcore pitch about uh, you know there there's there's this one guy he's he's not uh, active full time in the ministry anymore but there's this one guy that if I was in the service and I knew he was taking up the offering I'm leaving my money at home because if I bring it with me once he gets through with me it's gone I mean I'm just gonna give it uh, I hate that. I'll just be honest with you. I hate it when somebody, you know, they're just so good at squeezing the money out of you that you just kind of go, oh, okay, yeah. Uh, you, know how to, you know how to fix that? Most of you have heard God loves a cheerful giver, right? But the rest of that verse, that verse starts out by saying that we're not supposed to give under compulsion but we're supposed to give what we have decided in our hearts to give. And what that means is don't wait till you get here to decide what you give. That's something that you do earlier. and That's something you do before you get here. That, that the Lord speaks to your heart during the week, and then you come ready. And when you come ready, then there's no compulsion. And it, and, there, and it is cheerful. It's fun. It's actually good. So take that for what it's worth. That's something I learned from a little child on up, and it's a good word. Father, thank you for the blessings that you have poured into our lives. Thank you, Father, for the provision because we acknowledge that everything belongs to you. And thank you for the joy in giving. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, Spring House. My name is Tina Bryson. Um, I wasn't sure I was going to make it to church on time this morning. I came to first service because I knew I was going to be speaking today. And if you're anything like me, if you have littles at home, I have a three-year-old and a seven-year-old, um, getting out of the door on time is not always an easy task. I usually have four kind of time zones in my brain when we're getting ready. One is, oh, we're gonna be early. Hey, we're gonna be on time. Oh, we're running late. And then the why bother phase. Like, why are we even trying to leave the house at this point? Because whatever we're going to has probably ended and nobody is there. And this morning, we were kind of getting into that critical area of we're on time, but you know, if one more thing happens, 
we're going to be late. And I could feel myself getting anxious and nervous and stressed. And I saw my daughter also getting that way because of what I was giving out to her. And so I, I was just started praying and I said, God, I, I need your help. This is hard. I don't know how to get this moving along. It feels kind of like a train wreck this morning. I, I need your help. And he told me, just breathe. I'm with you. You're going to get there when you get there. And my timing is perfect. And so I just rested in that. And I said to my daughter, his timing is perfect. We'll get there when we need to get there. It's not a problem. And we made it and we were on time. Look at God. I say that to, uh, to say this. If you are a mom who is an early mom, an on-time mom, a late mom, or I shouldn't even bother getting ready to go anywhere kind of mom, I want to invite you to our Heritage Moms group. I'm a stay-at-home mom, and uh, the Heritage Moms group is for mommies that are at home with their littles that want to have some adult connection and conversation during, uh, during the week. So we meet on the first Monday of every month. Our next meeting is on May 6th. We meet from 9.30 to 11, and the church has provided us an amazing space where the kids are safe. I don't have to worry about them being fenced in. We play on the playground or in one of the preschool classrooms, and we just connect. We uplift, we encourage, we share laughter, we share tears. Sometimes some meltdowns happen. Usually it's the kids, uh, not always. And... Um, but it's just a beautiful time to connect and get together. The moms that attend are amazing. They love God. They love their children. And they love me. They love each other. And it's just a beautiful space. I invite those mommies that have infants up to five years of age, if you are able to come um, the first Monday of every month from 930 to 11, we would love to have you. Thank you. I want to come to the mom's group just to get away from my kids, too. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just being real. Uh, hey, guys, I'm Pastor Justin. I am part of the Springhouse Business Collective, and I wanted to take a minute to talk to the um, business owners, business leaders, managers, uh, CEOs, presidents, or even aspiring entrepreneurs here at Springhouse. During our conference, we launched our Springhouse Business Collective, and that is where we are trying to take all of those leaders that I just meant mentioned in the business world and come together and see how we can encourage and use our businesses as ministry in the kingdom. We uplift each other, we learn, we grow, we eat food, because I don't want to do anything if a biscuit is not involved. So we're normally going to start meeting on the second Tuesday of the month. I know we've got first Mondays, last Monday, second Tuesday, but I'll make it real easy. Next Tuesday morning, 8 a.m., Fellowship Hall, we're going to be connecting. Uh, our business collective is led by Joshua McLeod with GrowAbility. So there's going to be some dynamic teaching uh, tools that you can implement in any area of business that you may be in. If you have people under you or you're running Fortune 500 companies, uh, and there are some of those here at Springhouse, um, you're going to be getting tools that you can apply kingdom principles within your business um, so come join us next Tuesday, 8 a.m. over here in the Fellowship Hall, and I uh, hope to see you guys there. And that's this Tuesday, two days from now. It's this this Tuesday, not next Tuesday, but this, this, the, the next Tuesday in two days. <laughs> You say next Tuesday to me, I'm going out a week, okay? But yes, it's, it's, it's uh, two days from now. Guys, good morning. How are you this morning? Are we good? If you're joining us on live stream, thank you for joining us this morning. It is a glorious day to be here because God is in the house. Amen? Amen. Um, just real quick, because I don't want to take any time, more time away from our, uh, our guest speaker. If you are new to Spring House, we are going to have a newcomer's lunch in two Sundays from now. So that would be not next Sunday, but the next Sunday, right? April 28th, April 28th, right following this gathering, we're going to provide a lunch for you. Our pastoral staff is going to be available, and uh, we just want to meet you and tell you about Springhouse. So that's going to be on April 28th. Make plans to attend uh, that if you are new here to Springhouse, okay? Uh, guys, we have a special guest speaker with us. He has been with us before. He has an on-time word this morning. Would you guys please stand to your feet and welcome Pastor Jonathan Evans.
Good morning. morning. Y'all doing all right? Good, good to be here once again. It's been several years since I've been here, but it's good to see familiar faces and be back in the house. Before I get started jumping into God's Word, I have my better half here with me. And so, Kanika, stand up, stand up, say hello to everyone. As you can tell, I outkicked my coverage on that one. I outkicked my coverage on that one. Uh, but I'm excited to have the opportunity to share. She's here with me, so she gets a good little uh, break from our five children. She's a stay-at-home mom as well, formerly a physical therapist, but she stays at home and homeschools. So, so she's, she's got it going on. And I, uh, my oldest daughter' name is Kelsey. She's 15 years old. She's the artist in the house. She loves to sing, color, dance, draw, anything but, you know, formal learning. Uh, and then we have Jonathan II. His name is J2, just to throw a little swag on it. Uh, but J2 is my intellectual. He, he's the one who asked the question why, which gets the common parental response, because I said so, boy. I ain't got time to be explaining everything to you. Uh, and so that's, that's my boy J2. And then I have, after that, Camden. Camden is my 10-year-old. Uh, we call him Spider Cam because he climbs on everything. He's not happy unless he's trying to beat up his brother, wrestle his dad, or swinging from the chandelier in our kitchen. Uh, and so that's Camden. Then I have Kyler. Kyler is uh, my eight-year-old daughter, and she is the athlete of the family. Okay, she is fast now. At seven years old, her first, first quarter time was a minute and 20 seconds. And so she was flying around that track as a seven-year-old. And so I said, it was not for me. That's your mom. Uh, <laughs> And then uh, I have Jade Winter, who's our five-year-old, and uh, she just basically has all of her siblings jealous because she's the baby. That means she gets whatever she wants. Uh, is there any babies in the house? Is there any babies in the house? Isn't that the best? It's the best position. You got parents taking care of you, siblings taking care of you. You know what I mean? Your parents are already tired. They're like, whatever, just do whatever. You, you know what I mean? So uh, it's a great position. So I'm excited to introduce my family to you this morning. Y'all ready for the word? Let's jump in. Heavenly Father, we love you and honor you. If you don't do anything else, you've already done enough by sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. Help us to believe in it and walk in it. We love you and give you the glory as you teach us today. Help us to remember the words, and we remember the words by applying the words, so that it's not like a seed that falls amongst the thorns that just gets choked out. We love you and we honor you today. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to read one thematic verse for you, and uh, that verse comes from Exodus 122. I want you to key in today because you'll learn uh, some principles that I really believe can change your life. It has mine uh, from this story. So Exodus 122, so Bibles, Bible apps, uh, whatever, I want you to be able to see this. Exodus 122, it simply says this, Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born, you ought to cast into the Nile. Every daughter, you ought to keep alive. One more time. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born, you ought to cast into the Nile. And every daughter, you ought to keep alive. Today, I want to talk to you from the topic, Surviving Pharaoh. Surviving Pharaoh. Here is a commander-in-chief, if you will, who has put out an edict in the land. An edict is an official order by someone in power. Basically, he said, y'all, this is what we finna do. And everybody has to prepare to do what he says to do. And he has an evil edict, an afflicting edict against the Hebrew people. He said, every Hebrew boy that is born, I want you to throw him into the Nile. I want you to take him out. Every daughter, I want you to keep alive. What he's doing here is he's a little insecure. The enemy is a little afraid because he does not want the advancement of God's kingdom. He's in the business of advancing his own kingdom. And one of the things I want you to notice is that while the enemy is coming after everyone, he does have a specific hit out on men. He is not interested in godly men, godly fathers, Godly husbands, godly city council, godly men in the church, godly men leading their community. He's not interested in godly men stepping up and stepping out. He's not interested in none of that. And so what he wants to do is put out an edict to take out the men because in society at large, 
In all of history, there has never been a society in all of history that has ever survived without strong men. So if you can take them out, then you can take out a culture. Has nothing to do with the significance of women because here he's talking about a military threat. And so he's saying, I need to multiply, and the Hebrew people are multiplying at a faster rate, and that makes me insecure. Don't you know that the enemy is insecure when the church of Jesus Christ begins to multiply? That's not something that he's interested in. And in this context, he's speaking from a military standpoint, so he's really specifically thinking about taking out men because he's thinking in terms of war, okay? And so what he says in Exodus 1-9, he says, He said to the people, Behold, the people of the sons of Israel are more mightier than we. Come, let us deal wisely with them, or else they will multiply in the event of war. Okay? Or else they will come against us, multiply and come against us in the event of war. So the enemy here is thinking in war terms, so he comes up with this edict. Let's go ahead and get rid of these boys before they grow up. I want to get the boys before they become men. Okay? So you need to understand this, mothers, that your sons— They don't fly in on storks. This ain't Dumbo. They come out of your wombs, and you need to understand that when it comes to spiritual warfare, when it comes to war, the enemy is trying to take men out. So if you've ever said to yourself, boy, it sure is hard to find a good man, understand that that what you see, if all you see is what you see, you do not see all there is to be seen. The enemy has a hit out on everyone, but he's got his eye on men because he knows what happens when strong men stand up and say, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Okay, he already knows that, and and I need you to understand what he's saying is, is I don't, I'm really not interested, and I'm really afraid because the Hebrew people, God's people, are multiplying. That's not what I'm interested in. Understand, from the beginning, the enemy is just an imitator of God. God said from the beginning, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. God's goal is the visible manifestation of his invisible self all over the earth. Okay, and so that's his goal. When, when Noah docks the ark in and, and, and Genesis 9, he gives them the same command he gave Adam and Eve. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. He tells the disciples the same concept in Matthew 28. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations. Be fruitful and multiply and make replicas of who I am. The enemy is insecure with more godly people coming into the fold because he wants to build his kingdom. And not only does he want to build his kingdom through multiplication, he wants to build his kingdom and is so bold to try to use God's people to do it. Here, he's trying to enslave God's people to build his kingdom. He doesn't mind you going to church. He just minds you being the church. He minds the multiplication. He don't mind you sitting in a worship service. He just doesn't want you to break huddle from the worship service. Um, As as a uh, chaplain of the Dallas Cowboys, I know I'm, I'm a Dallas Cowboy. I know there's Green Bay people in here, especially your pastor. Your pastor is a Green Bay guy. I ain't worried about none of that. I'm up here. I'm talking. As a chaplain of the Dallas Cowboys, 100,000 people don't come to AT&T Stadium or Texas Stadium to watch 11 men bend over and have a private conversation in a huddle. That's not what they come for. They don't mind the huddle, but they want to know what difference the huddle makes. They want to know, having now huddled, can you now score? What are you going to do about 11 other men on the other side of the ball daring you to go public with that private conversation? That's why people come in. You got to understand this is a huddle. But the kingdom of God wants to know what difference the huddle makes. They want to know, having now huddled, can you now score? What are you going to do about Pharaoh outside of these buildings daring you to go public with this private conversation? Pharaoh is totally okay with this private conversation, but once the the church of Jesus Christ begins to break huddle, begins to multiply, begins to teach their children, have healthy families, begin to to multiply and infiltrate the culture, then all of a sudden he becomes insecure and has a plan of attack. So you need to understand that that's what he's doing here, is that in this context he is 
insecure. Do you know that the devil's insecure? He, he, don't, he does not like when God's people do more than be churchy. <laughs> We're good at being churchy, but he don't like it when we start multiplying. And so he comes up with an initial plan. His plan is found in Exodus 1, verse 11. He says, so they appointed taskmasters over them to afflict them with hard labor. And they built for Pharaoh his cities and Ramses and all of those different things. So his plan was, I'm going to make life so hard on them that it will prevent them from being encouraged enough to multiply. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to appoint taskmasters to just give them a hard time and make life hard on them. I need you to understand that the enemy uses affliction to make things hard on you and to make you stop. But God will allow you to be afflicted to actually produce in you something that he can use for his purpose he has in you. So while the enemy is using affliction to stop them, God is allowing affliction to take them. Okay, so I need you to understand that. But what the enemy does is he says, I'm going to make things so hard on them that they don't want to continue in the faith. Okay, if you're going through affliction, you need to think of it differently. Affliction means that God has a purpose. If, if God, my, I, my coach used to tell me, if I don't yell at you and I'm quiet, that's when you need to be worried. <laughs> if I'm yelling at you, it's because I see something in you that, I'm going, that I think can grow and become better and be useful for the team. But if I'm quiet, then I don't really think that you're that good. I don't think that you're usable. In other words, when things are loud in your life and there's affliction in your life, it's because the enemy knows that God has something major for your life. And you cannot build a skyscraper on the foundation of a chicken coop. Anytime you see a skyscraper in downtown Nashville, the higher they go up is evidence of how low they had to dig down. God will allow something to get dug down in your life and afflictions and hard times in your life, but that is evidence that the enemy is insecure of the skyscraper that God wants to put on top of it. And so you need to understand that even in your affliction, that's what the Bible says in the book of James, consider it joy when you go through various trials and affliction because I am producing something in you. Okay, so the Christian sees affliction differently than the non-Christian sees affliction. We see affliction as, oh, you afflict, you, you, you think so highly of me. I'm glad you think about me the way you are because I'm going through this affliction because there's something that God must be doing. And so you need to understand because the people of God, this is what Pharaoh found out. It says in verse 11, so he appointed taskmasters in verse 12. He said, but the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied. Because God knows when there's affliction, all of a sudden the people of God are more dependent on God. When there's affliction, all of a sudden they're praying again. When there's affliction, all of a sudden the church is full. When there's affliction, all of a sudden they're linking arms. God will allow the affliction because in affliction, actually the church begins to multiply. So the enemy was like, well, that didn't work. <laughs> Pharaoh said that, that plan wasn't a good plan. That, that actually went against what I'm trying to do. They are multiplying even the more with the affliction. So he has to come up with a new plan. And the new plan is found in Exodus 1.15. Y'all still following along or am I going too fast? Y'all still with me? Okay, good. Got to stay with it now. Exodus 1.15, it says, Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, one who was named Shifra and the other named Pua. And he said, when you are helping the Hebrew women to give birth and see them upon the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall put him to death. And if it is a daughter, then you shall let her live. Okay, so the affliction didn't work. So do you know what Pharaoh just said? Okay. This dude is so slick and so sly that he went to the Hebrew midwives 
not the Egyptian midwives. He didn't go to his people. He went to the Hebrew midwives and said, let me holler at you for a minute. Whenever there's a Hebrew woman who's giving birth, if it is a son, Hebrew midwives, I need you to put the Hebrew boys to death. If it is a daughter, let her live. Okay, let me say that again. Y'all didn't get that. Uh. <laughs> Hebrew midwives need you to go kill the Hebrew boys. Well, that's bold. Hebrew midwives, I need you to go kill your Hebrew boys. Okay, y'all still ain't. Spring house, y'all ain't. Okay. <laughs> Pastor Kevin, I got to tell him in a more modern way. The enemy went to God's women and tell them to go kill God's men. So the enemy must know the power, the influence, the ability. He must know that there is enough influence, power, and ability in women that if he can distort them, he can take out a culture of men. Okay. There's not enough of people talking about the power of women. But if the enemy knows it, certainly we should know it. Because from the beginning, Eve, let me holler at you. He skipped Adam. He said, Eve, let me holler at you. I'm going to use your influence. Offer this brother this fruit. He's going to eat it if it comes from you. <laughs> Delilah, just cut his hair. It's his hair. Jezebel, kill the prophets. Herodias, y'all know who Herodias? Y'all like, Herodias, who is that? <laughs> Herodias in Matthew 14 got her daughter to go get the head of John the Baptist. Through Scripture, if you look through it, the enemy knows he can use the power and influence of women to go take out men in God's plan. But also the opposite is true. That's why Proverbs 14, 1 says, a wise woman builds her house, but a foolish one tears it down with her bare hands, which means and suggests that a woman has the power to build a house. She also has the power to tear a house down. Women possess that power, and the enemy knows it, but guess what? God knows it too. That's why he would call Rahab to, to hide the, the spies and save her families while the walls are crumbling down. That's why he would call Ruth and tell her, uh -uh, don't go back to the past. It's time to go to the future and go with Naomi. And she meets a man named Boaz, has a son named Obed. Obed has a son named Jesse. Jesse has a son named David and puts her in the lineage of Jesus Christ. That's why he would call Priscilla. I need you to teach Apollos the word appropriately so that he can teach the gospel so that we can continue to multiply. That's why he would call Phoebe. Paul would send Phoebe out and tell the church of Rome to listen to her because she's able to help carry out the advancement of God's kingdom. There are women who were used for destruction, but there were also women who were used for building up. So I'm just letting you know, Springhouse Church ladies, that you have the power for good or the power for bad, and because we're the church of Jesus Christ, you can build the house. What am I telling you? I'm telling you, if you've ever heard the impact or ministry of Pastor Kevin, it's because you have his wife's fingerprint all over you. I'm telling you, if you've ever heard the ministry of Jonathan Evans, it's because you have Kanika's fingerprint all over you. If you've ever heard the ministry of Dr. Tony Evans, it's because you have the fingerprint of Lois Evans all over you. When the enemy came into the house, they told the enemy, no, I'm going to lift him up, not tear him down. And so I need you to understand that the enemy wants to use your experiences, your emotions, your past, your abilities, and he wants you to use it to tear down instead of build up because he knows you possess that power. I need you to understand that there would be no sermons on Moses if it wasn't for two ladies you've never heard of, Shifra and Pua. There would be no ser sermons on Moses. It's because they were able to look at the enemy and say, we are not doing that. I know the pressure, and you, Pharaoh is the most powerful man on the earth right now. He, he can, this is a very lucrative deal. You know, understand, he, he can write big checks, gold and silver, for Shifra and Pua to carry out his plan. But they thought, it is not good for me to take something that is momentary lucrative that will have our whole culture in debt. 
I need you to understand that you can do something that's in the moment that's emotionally lucrative, that can put your whole heritage in debt. Because the enemy wants to use the power to tear things down instead of build things up. And fortunately, fortunately for the scripture's advancement, because Moses is kind of a big deal. <laughs> fortunately for the scripture's advancement, these ladies got an influence by the enemy and looked at Pharaoh and said, modern, we ain't doing that. I mean, I understand what you can do and how much you can pay and how this may, but we just ain't doing that. We have to, we're going to have to find another way. And so Pharaoh's trying to get ladies to work for him did not work. But Pharaoh would not quit. It says in Exodus 1.22, then, this is back to our original passage that I read at the beginning. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people saying, every son who is born you ought to cast into the Nile. And every daughter you ought to keep alive. So he's trying again. Um, so I'm going back to our original verse. But uh, you need to know that Pharaoh had already tried. This is his third try. Okay, affliction God's people didn't work. Trying to get the ladies to tear it down didn't work. So now he called all his people. He had to go back to his minions. He had to go back to his minions and say, okay, now let's try this again. So now that we're back at my initial verse and I've got the introduction out the way, we can get going. <laughs> so now, you need to understand that Pharaoh is after what has been conceived in you that you have given birth to that you want to see develop, you want to see it grow, you want to see it be nourished, you want to see it come to maturity. He wants to kill whatever that thing is. He will let you live, but he wants to kill the thing that gives you life. Because if he can kill the thing that gives you life, then he can even enslave God's people to build out his plan. He can make you so anxious, so depressed, so fearful, losing faith, become a doubter. He can put you in position where you're actually doing more harm to the kingdom than good because you're wondering, well, if I don't have this, what is it all for? And God must not be on my side. And God is not working it out for good. And God is not doing it. I thought the pastor said this. Maybe he's not. And if he can get believers to start talking like that, then he can have you enslaved even though you've been set free. That's why Galatians 5.1 says, it is for freedom that you have been set free. Therefore, never again return to the yoke of slavery, which means there's a yoke of slavery you can return to even if you've been set free. You say, say verses backwards, you'll get them. <laughs> so he says, I know something's been conceived in you. And as soon as you deliver it and your expectations are that you'll get to raise it and nurse it and develop it, oh, I'm coming for it. And this is now the start of the story where there's a lady who gives birth. In Exodus 2, 2, it simply reads, the woman conceived and bore a son. Ah. Oh, man. You know how people do the uh, reveals? And they pop, it's a girl. Yeah, it's a boy. Yeah, not here. It's a girl. It's a boy. Oh. Now, you can't read these stories like novels. You have to read them and put yourself in it. She has a baby and it's a boy. And she saw that he was beautiful, verse 2, and hid him for three months. Can you imagine hiding a baby for three months? You got to put yourself in there now. Shh, shh, no. That's nurse all the time. Keep you quiet. I don't know what their diaper situation was, but probably wouldn't, you know. Uh, it's just a disaster. It's a disaster. She saw that the baby was beautiful. The word beautiful there means healthy, meaning, oh, this is great. But now I have to, tr since it's great, I'm going to do what I can to protect it, okay? 
Many of you have beautiful things. You're excited about it, it's great. So now you put your hands on it to do what you can to protect it. Simple as that. That's what she's doing. Beautiful baby, baby boy, I want to protect him. I want to make sure that the enemy does not get his hands on this thing, this person. And many of you have callings, destinies, purpose. You have families. You have children, relationships. You have businesses. You have uh, uh, finances. You have things that you desperately want the enemy to keep his hands off of. Is that correct? So what we do initially is we try to use our stamina, our relationships, our intellect. We try to use our finances. We try to use our wit. We try to use our whatever it is to try to keep the baby safe so that it doesn't come in contact with the enemy's plan. Am I right by saying that? Okay. This is what she was doing. And it's a disaster because it's very hard when Pharaoh has an edict out against you and you're doing what you can to keep the baby safe, whatever it is for you, it becomes a struggle. How do you know when Pharaoh is after your baby? Simple. Your blessing starts turning into a burden. Have you ever had a blessing that starts becoming a burden? Your battle is not against flesh and blood. It's against the rulers, the principalities, the world forces of darkness, the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. The reason why your hands are burning is because Pharaoh's on the other end of the rope. And you're playing tug of war in the spiritual realm, trying to keep the baby safe, through which there's going to be a kingdom advancement. So that's why it's hard, is because if you can picture Pharaoh doing this, trying to pull out of your hands what God has placed in your hands, that's why your hands are burning. So I need you to understand that for her, she got to a place where the blessing was now becoming a burden, and it became hard to hold this precious baby. Verse 3 lets you know it says, but when she could no longer hide him, I don't know if you've ever gotten to a place where you told God, I just can't do it anymore. Some of us have gotten to a place in our marriages or with our wayward children or with our business, trying to keep it together or our home or our school or our th the things that we're trying to put together. I can't do, I'm tired. Three months of keeping this baby quiet? And Pharaoh's minions are everywhere. I'm tired. I can't do it anymore. So for any person in this room that has ever experienced being tired, or you are tired, or if you're not one of those two, you will be. Because <laughs> trials in this world are like the mailbox that you get in your mailbox that says occupant. Translation, we don't care who lives here. You just have to be on earth, and you're going to get some. You're about to learn a valuable lesson in surviving Pharaoh. She couldn't do it anymore. Time was up. Three months is a long time. You know how slow three months goes trying to hide a baby? It feels like forever, and your hands are burning and cramping up, trying to hold on with your own power. It says that she put the baby in a wicker basket, covered it with tar and pitch, and placed it in the Nile. What? Okay. You got to be at your wit's end to put the baby in the Nile yourself. Now, if you've ever gotten to a place, ladies and gentlemen of Springhouse Church, where you begin to lose your mind trying to keep something safe or keep something healthy or keep something going, do you know why you're losing your mind? Because you just stepped into God territory. And once you step into God territory, you find out quickly you ain't him. So then you start to lose your mind to hold it yourself. When you're losing your mind, he's just allowing you to experience what's evident. That is that you have stepped into a territory that your humanity can't handle. And when you're handling things in the spiritual realm, you may have to go get the spiritual realm to help handle that thing. Because that is a realm that's too strong for your hands. And while Pharaoh's hands are stronger than your hands, God's hands are stronger than Pharaoh's hands. 
Matter of fact, God doesn't even have to use both. The Bible says the mighty right hand of God. He can just use one on Pharaoh, just. And so she realizes this is too big for me. I can't do it anymore. I can no longer hold on to this situation. I'm losing my mind, which is evident that I'm in God territory, and God will allow you to lose your mind so that you can come to the realization of how good at being God you are. Not that good. And then what do we do? We get to a place after some of us three years, some of us a decade, some of us three months, some of us figure it out quick. I've got to put this situation in a basket and put it in the Nile. This lady said, God, I'm giving the baby to you. I can't do it anymore. I need you to know, Springhouse Church, this is, this is very, you need to grab this, that your survival will not be contingent upon what you're able to hold on to. Your survival will be contingent upon what you're able to let go of. And if you're not willing to let go of it, then you won't experience God in your life who is able to do much more than what you can do keeping that thing in your hands. A lot of us think we're waiting on God and God is saying, no, I'm waiting on you and I got more time than you, trust me. <laughs> she puts the baby in a wicker basket and places it in the Nile. Now, I know some of you scholars are thinking, now, how did you get she gave it to God by putting it in a basket and putting it in the Nile? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Wicker basket in the Hebrew is translated ark. Y'all didn't get that? <laughs> the ark found in Genesis 6 was used for the salvation of Noah's family. So he built the ark for purposes of salvation. So when she put the baby in the wicker basket, which is translated ark, she didn't put the baby in there for death. She put the baby in there for life. She had the full expectation that if I give this baby to the ark, if I place faith in the ark, Jesus Christ, then my life will be saved. So this wicker basket actually represents the ark, which represents Jesus Christ, who's our salvation. So she was fully expecting salvation by putting the baby in the ark. So she put it in the hands of God. She went to the prayer closet. She came to the church service. She had an expectation that if I go to God with my problem and put it in his hands and let it go out of my hands, that he can do a much better job in the basket than I can do in my hands. And so she's saying here, God's word is saying here, that you need to get ready if you haven't gotten ready, and take that situation and put it in the hands of God. But not only did she put it in the wicker basket, it says she covered it with tar and pitch. Genesis 6. Genesis 6, uh, the Bible says that the word of the Lord came to Noah and said, make yourself an ark, make yourself an ark of gopher wood. You shall cover it with tar and pitch. So then I had to look up pitch. Well, what's pitch? The Hebrew word for pitch is kafir. The root word of the Hebrew word means atonement. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> atonement has to do with reconciliation, forgiveness of sins. So she had to repent. She had to say, it is actually sinful to trust me than it is to trust you. I repent, Lord. Here's the situation. Let me reconcile my trust in you and my faith in you. How do you know if you trust God? I can tell by what you do. I can tell by whether you give them the baby or not. Anybody can say they believe until there's a baby that has to be given up. And once there's a baby that has to be given up, then all of a sudden there's some reconciliation that needs to happen. And so she is in a repented state that, Lord, I am sorry that I thought more of my hands than I did of your hands. So let me reconcile, and how I reconcile is by giving my life away, giving my situation away, actually placing it in your hands. We walk by faith, not by sight. Faith is acting like it is so, even when it's not so, so that it might be so, simply because God said so. <laughs> faith is actionable. You can feel faith-ish and not have much faith. 
You can feel like you don't have a lot of faith and have a whole lot of faith because faith has to do with your feet and your movement, not just your feelings. And here she's reconciling with God because she's saying, I'm going to put it in the basket. I'm going to cover it with tar and pitch so that it's sealed from the devastation of the Nile. Um, don't you know that if you're in Christ, the Bible says in Ephesians 1.13, you are sealed by the Spirit. Don't you know that there is Romans 8.1, there is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So she's sealing it with the full expectations that the crocodiles won't be able to get through it. She's sealing it with the full expectation that even if I put my baby in the same scenario where everybody else is drowning, my baby will have destiny. The Nile was the place of devastation, but for her it was the place of deliverance. The Nile was the place where everybody else was dying, but for her it was the place where, where she would be surviving. Because in the hands of God, you can be in the same scenario where everybody else is getting destroyed and be experiencing victory. Here she is placing the baby, what we need to do. I, I'm giving it to the hands of God. Now notice, she doesn't put the baby in the Nile without a wicker basket. Okay, there's wicker basket, then Nile. Okay, I need you to understand this. If there's no wicker basket, you're going to be dead. <laughs> you have to have the wicker basket, meaning the expectation of what you're letting go is that God will save it. I want to make sure, Pastor Kevin, that nobody thinks that I'm saying, well, great, I'm going to let my marriage go. The pastor said I can let it go. I'm just going to take this marriage like a football and punt it. Boom. <laughs> oh, no. That's not expectation of salvation. That's just selfish. No, he says wicker basket. If I'm letting it go, I'm letting it go for the purpose of salvation. That God will bring it back. Now, okay, here we go. Are y'all are still with me? Yeah. Are you tracking? Okay, so, um, so she does, remember, put yourself in the story. This is very difficult. A mother, you're talking about trusting God with your situation. She's trusting God with a literal baby. Whatever your situation is, is hard, but it ain't like this. She's putting a baby with the crocodiles? That is a level of trust that we can only aspire to. But that's the level of trust that God deserves. Um, she puts the baby in the now. Now, verse 4 says, his sister stood at a distance to find out what would happen to him. So this is Moses' sister Miriam. Moses' sister Miriam is watching this like, oh my goodness, this is terrible. She's watching her mother's faith. And at first, it's scary to watch the generation before you or your parents show faith and just give things to God. You're thinking to yourself, you've lost your mind. But this little girl is watching her mother's faith, okay? I need you to remember that and lock that in the back of your mind, okay? She's watching her mother's faith. At the moment that Moses' mother puts him in the Nile, watch what happens. Verse 5, the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe in the Nile with her maidens walking along the Nile, and she saw the basket among the reeds and said to her maid um, to, to bring it over and sent her maid to go get it, and she brought it to her. So when... when Moses' mother puts the baby in the Nile. By luck and chance, <laughs> Pharaoh's daughter decides she stinks and wants to come take a bath in the Nile. I need to go take a bath at the moment Moses' mother puts the baby in the Nile because God's not doing anything. It's just all happenstance and luck. And Pharaoh, as the story goes, Pharaoh's daughter says, hey, go get that basket. The basket comes over. It's a baby. And she says, oh, my goodness, coochie, coochie, coo. <laughs> this is all luck and chance that Pharaoh loves, Pharaoh's daughter loves babies. She knows it's a Hebrew boy, but she doesn't care because she just felt pity in her heart. It's just kind of a, a thing that happened. But I want you to notice that now Moses is taken out. 
but God's sovereignty would only pick up what she put down. If she doesn't put it down, then Pharaoh finds that boy a different way. When she puts it down, then God's sovereignty comes and picks him up. God's sovereignty is waiting on you to put it down. Because he has a plan. He's waiting on you to stop doing his job. Pharaoh's daughter, shoop, picks the baby up. And she says, coochie, coochie, coo. And then watch this. Remember that thing I told you to put in the back of your head? What did I tell you to put in the back of your head? You don't remember. Miriam. Miriam was watching. So at first she's nervous, but she's also watching everything that I just told you play out. Pharaoh's daughter pick it up. She's watching the maid go get it. She's watching Pharaoh's daughter say, coochie, coochie, coo. And now she's watching her mother's faith play out. See, when you give your things to the Lord, parents, your children get to watch God work in your life. They get to watch it play out. And when they're able to watch faith work, then they know faith works. But we talk a lot in church, but nobody's trusting God, and so they're out there in the culture just trying to figure it out on social media like everybody else because they've never seen their parents put it in the Nile. And here Miriam is watching Coochie Coochie Coo. She's watching Pharaoh's daughter do all these things. She's watching this play out, and she's like, immediately, the boy is not even in the Nile anymore. He's out. So now her faith is conjured up, and she wants to be a part of God's plan. Watch this. Verse 7, then his sister, Miriam, said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call a nurse from you from the Hebrew women so that she, so that she may nurse the child for you? Y'all ain't, come on, spring house. Yeah. <laughs> Miriam's daughter, it's a little girl. Now, you got to understand, her faith is conjured up because she's seeing God work. You can't just go up to Pharaoh's daughter. That's not how this works. They can have you killed. You're supposed to be a slave. If she's going up to Pharaoh's daughter, that means her faith in God has been conjured up. She is no longer afraid. She knows this God thing works. So she's coming against the culture now at a young age. Young people, you don't have to wait till you're old. God can use you when you're young. And so she comes. Y'all still with me? Y'all getting tired? Okay. So she comes up to Pharaoh's daughter and says, um, Listen here, I got an idea. You like the baby, right? Yeah, so coochie, coochie, coo. I saw you doing that. Um, I think it's a great idea. Since you like the baby, you don't want him to go hungry. I can go get a Hebrew woman uh, to nurse the baby for you. You know what Pharaoh's daughter's response was? That's a great idea. I would love that. That's awesome. Let's do that. That's a great idea. Little did Pharaoh's daughter understand that Miriam was just going to take the baby back to the mother. <laughs> she says in verse 8, Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go ahead. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Ooh, woo! You got to be kidding me. That child said, I love this. Let's go. Hey, I got an idea. Let's do this. Pharaoh's daughter, not knowing she's being used by God, is about to give the baby right back to the mother against the edict of her own father. <laughs> I need you to understand that... Uh, a boomerang only comes back when you let it go. That God is trying to return to you. The very thing that you have to trust him to put down. And he's going to work, the providence of God, he's going to work out the details. And bring that thing right back around. But not only is he going to bring it around, you're talking about God. Okay, Springhouse, this is God we're talking about. He don't just do the normal. Okay, y'all don't know the story. So let me, let me show you how to, okay, let me read this to you. You're going to trip out. You're going to trip out. Okay, here it goes. 
Pharaoh's daughter said, go, go get the, go get the mother. And she didn't say go get the mother, but go ahead, go get the Hebrew woman. So the girl went and got the child's mother. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to the child's mother, take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. She got paid to nurse her own baby? Because you need to understand that God can do exceedingly, abundantly, beyond all that you can ask or think. Watch this. According to the power that works in you. Everybody jumps over pews with the first part of Ephesians 3.20. They forget the last part. He can do exceedingly, abundantly beyond all that you can ask or think according to the power that works in you. So if you're experiencing a little bit of God, he's saying, well, I'm experiencing a little bit of you. Because when God's sovereignty picks something up, she got paid to do what she would have done for free. <laughs> you got to be kidding me. And this all came from one point and one concept. Let it go. I appreciate the grace that you're giving us this morning and sticking with us. Um, God is good, is he not? Let's hear it one more time for Pastor Jonathan. Did that bless you today? Amen. I so wanted to get him up here so quickly. We have a baby dedication, a, 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 some, a dedication today. So if you're the Ernst family, would you come up? Uh, come on up here and your family. And... Um, yeah. When we dedicate our children, we dedicate ourselves. And uh, here we uh, recognize, just like uh, just like Moses' mother, this one doesn't belong to me. <laughs> this belongs to you, right? And uh, so, I would like you guys to, hey there, <laughs> I'd like you guys to introduce yourselves and your children, tell everybody their names, and just. Um, my name is Aubrey, um, this is Hayden, this is Ryan. Hi, I'm Brad, we actually just moved here about two months ago. So. <laughs> I don't have any. <laughs> And so we're dedicating both of these, both of these kids, okay? So we have Hayden and Ryan, okay? We want to pray for you guys. Before we do, can I read a scripture over, over you guys from the book of Psalm 127? The word of the Lord says this, Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep for those he loves. Children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. I am so glad that the Lord brought your family to Springhouse. And it is our joy and honor to dedicate Hayden and Ryan today to the Lord. Would you guys stand with us and stretch out your hands here to these Father, I thank you so much for this family, and I thank you for these two precious kids. And Father, I ask, Lord, right now that you would bless them. I ask that you would keep them. I ask for Hayden and Ryan right now, God, Lord, that you would make your mighty face shine upon them and that you would use them to be valiant warriors for your kingdom. 
I pray, Lord, that while they're in school, while they're going to and fro, God, Lord, that you would order their steps, that you would protect them, that you would put faithful allies around them, God, and that, Lord, that you would use them in a mighty way to advance your kingdom. We understand that our children are gifts to steward, but really, they are yours. And so this family submits these two kids to you in Jesus' name. And the church said, amen, amen, amen. We love you guys. Bless you this morning. Amen, yeah. Hey, it's been a good morning. God is good, amen. Would you guys raise your hand? I'm gonna give you a blessing. May the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ give us the confidence, the faith, the bravery to let it go. In Jesus' name, amen. Be blessed, Spring House. Trust him.